Hello, everybody. We are going to get started here shortly. We're just give a few more seconds for some people to log in. See who's going to catch us in here on the first session, and we'll get started. All right, they can see and hear us. We're off to a good start, guys. All right, should we go ahead and get started? All right. Well, guys, uh, thank you for joining us for our first session here at the afternoon. Hope you guys have been having a great time so far. Um, we are in this session for Mot Motivating All Learners. My name is Dave Coriel. I'm going to be one of the three people presenting today. We also have Teresa. Chapman, Miranda Riley, and in the chat, we're also going to have some more of our um, uh, exceptional student services team. We have Tracy Wright and Amruta um, uh, Naramanchi um, manning the chat and kind of taking down some notes. And if you guys have questions or any anything like that, we can follow up with at a later time. So we'd love to hear from you guys as we're going through this, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so I'm working on a little poll for you guys. It's very simple, yes or no. Um, I'm going to go ahead and launch that for you. Um, but we're going to be talking about motivational theory first. And the, throughout the, the, uh, this session, we're going to move on to student needs and motivation, as well as best practices for increasing that motivation. Um, so the question I'm going to pose to you guys, think about it for a second. Are there tasks in your day that you avoid? All right, that's a pretty simple question. Go ahead and see if you guys can mark off in that poll. Yes or no, do you avoid tasks in your day? So all that's running there, guys. Um, thinking about those reasons why do we avoid them right so that question of why so we either avoid things or like really want to do things so that's what we're talking about with motivational theory it's explaining what drives us to be successful and work towards goals and a specific outcome so that why is that piece we need to figure out so why do we avoid tasks in our day if you said yes if you say no god bless you good for you <laughs> um, but it is basically in its simplest form, we look at things in terms of need, behavior, and satisfaction. So we have a need, we follow it with a behavior, and then there's that satisfaction that goes through, and then it kind of cycles through needs, behavior, and satisfaction. So that's kind of like a simple way to kind of break down motivational theory. Right? And we'll be getting into some more things about intrinsic and extrinsic motivators, um, some positive and negative things, and what we really strive for here at Prenda um, to, to have our intrinsic motivators um, as us as adults and guides, as well as our students. All right. So most of us said yes, and one person said no on that poll, so good for you. Uh, if you have any tips on how to not avoid anything throughout the day, make sure you put it in the chat box for everybody, okay? Um, so you guys may be familiar with this. This is uh, the... Hierarchy of Needs by Maslow, um, his Hierarchy of Needs there. And it's pretty common. Most people have heard of it. Maybe you haven't seen this type of graphic before. But I love how it links to a lot of things we're talking about today about the different parts of the brain, right? So we have down at the very bottom, 
we have those needs for safety, right? So trying to make sure that we're, those basic needs are met from physical needs and safety needs. And then we have our emotional brain, right, which is in that center block there for the physiological needs, where we have esteem, where, you know, feeling accomplishment or belonging to a group, a club, that love and needs, all those things with relationships, friends that we build within that emotional self and that emotional brain. And then we can get to that top part of the pyramid there where we're looking at the self-fulfillment needs, right? Self-actualization where you can really co go to strive for that potential that you want to see in yourself and your students to see in themselves. And the reason it's stacked in the pyramid like this is because within Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we kind of see that without those basic needs on the bottom, it's really hard for us to see our best self and image and imagine what we can do and what we can be if we're worried about some basic needs, belonging, uh, even if it's just, I'm hungry right now, right? We've all been in that moment where we've been hangry or something like that, right? Where it's hard to focus on other things other than I want food right now. So it's kind of the same idea in a simpler form and um, to uh, talk about those hierarchy of needs and those um, areas of the brain that we want to get kids through so they can be most successful and really strive to be the best best learner and, and individual they can. I think it's really important to, to pose a question as we go through all these things. It's like, how can you make your students and your the, everyone in your micro school and yourself throughout your day, how can you phrase things and make sure that those needs are being met and having an environment that really strives to reach that self-actualization part where we're in that learning brain area where we can really maximize as much as we can throughout our day. All right. So as we mentioned earlier, we're going to kind of get into extrinsic and intrinsic motivators. A little image on the side there you can see, it just basically shows how things are flowing, right? So intrinsic, it comes from within inside, goes outside, we do whatever it is, and it gives us that fulfillment inside. Extrinsic motivators more as an outside factor coming in, and it really kind of just encapsulates, encapsulates the difference of where is that motivation coming from, something outside or something within, right? Uh, extrinsic motivators, they kind of focus more on completion. So it's like get it done to get that outside external thing, right? There's not much going on with the internal part of that. An example might be a simple, here's a treat to complete your, for completing your work. Great job, you know? Um, getting that little trinket is the excitement rather than completing the work. It does decrease the quality of work because it's not focused on doing well and working hard. It's about getting it done to get that reward. And uh, it also may provide an immediate um, change in behavior an action, but long term it's not very successful because when that widget or that trinket, whatever it is, goes away or becomes less desirable, you start to see different effects because it's not something that is inside of it. Whereas when we focus that intrinsic motivator, uh, we want to focus on imagination, creativity, and personal growth, right? That learning brain area, it's 100% linked into that. Um, so an example might be you worked really hard on that last uh, lesson. Uh, I love you were able to persevere through conquer time. How did it feel to challenge yourself uh, when things are difficult, right? Why is that important? So posing those types of questions will activate that internal self to like verbalize and maybe start to think about why is that important for me, right? And maybe sometimes it might say, well, I don't think it's important, but they can justify why it's not. And it starts that conversation, which is a really important thing to have in those conversations. And it's led by those types of questions. Um, Building curiosity also gives you valuable insight when you ask questions. So sometimes you don't really understand something or what the this people in your uh, micro school might be feeling or going through when they're processing and going through these things. So if you ask questions, they can give you some very valuable insight to help you kind of motivate and then also guide the discussion to, to helping them better. Right? Often requires a, a little bit more effort and time but it is more long lasting. So that's what's really, really important about that intrinsic motivator. Putting that early work in and really working hard towards it is very long term. And that's what we're looking for, long term growth in learners. All right, so crossing the barrier between extrinsic and intrinsic, because there are differences, right? So intrinsic motivators are in our daily lives as adults, let alone as we're kids, right? I don't intrinsically want to go to the dentist. Right? I don't want to have to get work done on my teeth. You know, as much as I try and take care of them, it's, it's a motivator, but I don't want to go to the dentist, right? I do go to the dentist because it's important for me to have good oral hygiene, right? So that intrinsic barrier. So it's important to have those in our lives, but when is it important to be focusing on that intrinsic motivator? And really with the learning process, it is super important. 
So using positive praise and feedback instead of external rewards, this is one of those gray areas you may feel like, whereas intrinsic motivation um, may not be praising someone because that's external, right? But the way you phrase it and the way you link it to someone is really important to make sure that they understand why it's important to learning and also guiding it through a way of getting them out of that external into feeling good about themselves and the work that they did. So focusing on effort rather than completion is still really important when you're doing that praise, working really hard on something, they really persevered when something was hard, those types of external um, you know, praise is really good. Um, making sure you set meaningful goals and challenging throughout the time is really, really important. Uh, make sure they're attainable, both short and long terms is really important because you can say, what are we gonna do today? What's our goal for the week? And what's our goal for maybe the quarter, right? So thinking about how you can keep those goals and always check in on them to make sure that's motivating. Help define a sense of purpose in learning. You know, what are their interests? And if you can link their interests to learning, that's shown to be insurmountable. So it's it's really important to make sure like, okay, if you have a kid who's struggling to be focused and that motivation isn't there, how can we link something that they enjoy and turn it into learning material, okay? So there's a lot of examples you can think of for that, I'm sure, whether it's sports or music or dance, how can you create math, language arts, creativity, um, all those things, collaboration, how can we put all those things into what they love to create that love of learning and link the bridge between the two? All right, so this just kind of gives us a little idea of, you know, what this type of thinking and motivation can be like for our Conquer, Collaborate, and Create throughout the day. So intrinsic motivation um, through Conquer is a sense of accomplishment and pride in your work, sense of competence, right? So those really important things that they want to feel part of the team with Collaborate, right? Sense of belonging, so when we're working together. Helping peers is also an amazing thing. It shows that they understand what they're doing as well as building empathy, and understanding for others and different areas of growth. Um, and in the create process, what this would look like is a joy of making something new, right? And, and maybe challenging themselves to make something better than what they think. Hey, I can maybe make something better, right? Create something from their imagination. You know, my son loves Legos and he comes up with amazing things and it just blows me away sometimes. Um, excitement uh, experiencing with something or experimenting with something, excuse me. Um, just learning new and, and getting that inquisitive brain to really think about those things. Intrinsic motivation and the exceptional students. So thinking about how some students may struggle um, with learning, they come with all kinds of baggage, whether that's from just having issues with learning and struggling through different experiences and trauma or to having a disability of some kind that maybe making it a little bit harder for them to access things at a typical pace, and that's okay, but it may often affects their self-esteem. So we're in that sense of self, that mid-tier within the hierarchy of needs, and how can we build up that sense of a self in a position to create a love of learning is super important and is something to focus on and help build that through positive praise is one way to really help them build that understanding and, and, um, and love of learning. All right, and students that can find academics to be easy may not be, let me try that again. Students that find academics to be easy may not be, uh, find joy in learning because they're not being challenged, right? So whether it is someone who's really struggling or someone who is finds things easy and comes to them easy, we need to find ways to motivate them. So if someone says they're bored a lot of times, it's usually because it's really hard or it's really easy. So we wanna make sure that we can push through that, all right? And how can we guide them, you know, with an excitement of learning, um, the bare minimum is something that they would try and do, right? Unless we try and push them to, how can you create this in your own way? What can you do to make it better? And really challenge them through questioning to experience things in their own way and learning. We work with diverse learners in all of our micro schools. All of our students need support and our diverse and exceptional learners are gonna need individual attention in regards to motivation. Our students often struggle due to a lack of competence. So this lack of competence could come from a lot of areas, right? It could be a deficit of skills. It could be a particular academic subject. It could be difficulty with language or expressing language, uh, difficulty with processing and even memory. As you can hear, like the needs are gonna be very diverse in each of our micro schools. Additionally, our students may lack confidence. Um, 
This could be due to academic failure in the past, as Dave mentioned. It could be failure or peer pressure um, with, it, with other students in the school and even beliefs the students have about themselves. So you have these two, this competence and confidence kind of working together, as you can see in the graphic there. We must first tackle confidence with our students. Um, confidence in that, that praise being built up is really the beginning step with increasing motivation. As our confidence grows uh, and we begin to believe we can, our motivation is going to increase. And as our motivation increases, our engagement will increase. This academic engagement is that ready learner that is going to increase in their skills. So as we're talking about needing to build skills or academic skills or areas of deficit that our students might have, really it all comes back to motivating our students, right? First building confidence, increasing motivation, um, building that academic engagement, which will lead to academic skills growing as a result. Some of the specific students' needs that we wanted to talk about in regards to motivation are feedback, choice, and differentiation. All of our students benefit from this. Our diverse and exceptional learners are no exception um, and really rely heavily on these areas. So the first one being feedback. We must pay attention to our messaging and our timing in regards to feedback to make sure it's effective and appropriate for our students. So first in regards to messaging, really the big takeaway point is that it should be really clear and specific. Um, planning ahead how to specifically articulate your messaging and feedback. Um, being aware um, the the structure of what you're saying and how you're approaching that student with your words. Second, timing. And we've all heard timing is everything, and that is so true in regards to student feedback and increasing motivation. So timing of feedback should be as soon as possible, catching them in the moment. And the reason for that is, is so that we are catching them in the process. As that last point says under timing, they're still mindful of the task and maybe even still working to reach their goal. So it's that catch in the middle of Lexia. It's that catch in the middle of the collaborate time when they're working with a partner um, to give really, really meaningful feedback um, to help with their process. That's not always possible. Um, if you are needing to wait for a one-on-one -on -one time, the goal would be to catch them as quickly as possible while it's still a mindful experience. What types of feedback? We can give tons of types of feedback. This is just a short list, um, but feedback about the tasks they're working on. I mentioned that one already, catching them mid -lexia. Feedback about the process of the task, how they're working through it to create a result. Feedback about self-regulation, how they are presenting themselves, and then themselves as a person. Um, I think that's probably the most meaningful feedback and an area that Prenda's model really allows you to grow with in terms of community circles and really building connection with your with your learners in your micro school um, and it's something that is a major confidence booster i talked with a guide about a week ago um, and she said that one of her students like looked down a lot when she was giving feedback and she thought maybe she didn't like the feedback and the positive praise and asked what i thought about it and i said keep doing it i said keep doing it over and over because we can't help but feel when somebody says something genuine and kind and and uplifting to us we're going to respond our, our internal person responds to that positive feedback um, and so the even the student who seems to be shying away or seems to not have an impact for it those are the students that are going to rely on this feedback the most so the second one after feedback is student choice and Prenda is just set up so perfectly for student choice our diverse learners really rely on student choice and it is a major motivator um, it allows the student to approach their learning rather than respond to learning being presented to them. I think that's the most valuable part of it. Um, it allows for student success, for them to choose something that they are successful with um, and build on it. Um, it. It fits right in. You guys know this with Prenda's model as well, with the idea of daring greatly. What can I go do? What am I capable of? How can I risk learning? And learning over comfort. Um, what am I capable of doing um, as I have autonomy as a learner? This is huge for a huge continuum of learners. If you think every student in your micro school is, is an individual and has individual needs. That's kind of how we believe in exceptional student services too. We have a huge range of student needs and there's gonna be areas of strength and areas of weakness and areas of need with every student. Um, and so we can really tap into that diverse range all the way from a student with significant needs to a student who may be gifted and talented and need to be pushed for that creative individuality. Everyone on there can benefit from this idea of um, student choice and it will be motivating to 
very diverse learners. All right, and then our last one that I wanted to mention for diverse learners is this idea of differentiation. Differentiation really simply is adjusting to our students' needs. We do this all of the time. And what's fun about facilitating education for learners is we're never done doing this. It's this continuous work in progress as our students change, right? Their needs change and they have people change in terms of what they need from the adults in their lives. So three big ways, oh, and I wanted to say this because I think this is really great. It's really making sure the right students get the right tasks at the right time, which in that sentence you can hear a continuous work in progress. Um, there's lots of ways we can differentiate as guides. The three big ones I wanted to mention are, are in regards to content. We can differentiate our content, our process, and our product. Content, in brief definition, would be adjusting our learning tool. What are we presenting to students to differentiate and meet their needs? We do this all the time. Um, we can differentiate our process, the method we're using to deliver that content. Um, and we can differentiate the product. Product is basically how students would show us what they know. Um, all of those things can happen continuously. We are doing it based on student need. Um, so lots of data is coming at us continuously about our students, some in more formal ways and some in more, more informal ways. The first way we're gathering data about our students is based on student readiness. Student readiness comes from um, data we have on our students. We can think of data like iReady assessment data or NWEA assessment data. We can also think of data as um, what we saw on Alexia progress report that day or um, what you saw the students struggling on as you walked around the room. Based on student interest, I'm going to talk about interest in just a second because I wanted to mention that one separately. And then last, based on learning profile. In short, a learning profile is, is how did our student learn best? What do we know about them? Um, what pr information have they provided us? And what have we learned from working with them to maximize their experience? Student interest, I wanted to separate it out because it is such a massive motivator for students um, and such a motiva uh, such way to increase motivation for a student. It builds confidence, um, which again, confidence is that first piece in building that motivation cycle. It also reduces and removes barriers that might exist due to low confidence or a lack of, or a gap in a skill, as we mentioned a few slides ago. So accessing prior knowledge, so what, we are, what a student already knows. So if I know a lot about um, World War history, I'm coming in with that prior knowledge or experience. I've traveled a lot um, in the Southwest United States, so that would be my experience. Accessing both of those for me is going to reduce learning discomfort. It's going to reduce any stress I have about coming into something new. Um, I mentioned this already, but it's on the screen again. Um, it, it's also, so not only are you building up a student, but you're removing something as well. So you're removing that barrier that is, is coming from two places, um, lack of confidence and potential a skill gap that is, is, is playing on there too. Ways to incorporate student interest. You guys do this every day. Um, we're going to bring up some specific ideas in a moment, but a simple interest survey is a great way to find out what are your students interested in and what do they know. If your students aren't giving you a whole lot, you can do an interest survey with the family too. Project-based learning, I have an exclamation point there because we do this every day in Prenda, right? This project-based learning um, based around student interest is massive for increasing motivation. And then asking the students for ideas. Um, there's a lot of ways that we can do this. Some that I've heard from guides is having rotating responsibilities of coming up with create and collaborate projects, coming in with an idea from home or brainstorming with a family member or with another student in the micro school of what could we bring to the table? What am I an expert in or what do I love learning about? So you could do that way. Um, I've also heard of guides doing different versions of having students contribute to future ideas. One way I'm calling it the parking lot would be to have a visual place in your micro school where students could add ideas. So they add a little sticky note when they think of something what they want to learn about. This kind of like hands off approach might be good for students who are a little bit more hesitant to participate. Um, having that visual reminder that like, hey, no pressure. I'm not making it be your turn to be innovative and um, uh, come up with your own idea and use student interest. But when you want to, here's an access point. Um, you could also have students share in community circle um, different ways that they think that they could bring their interest into the learning. So lots of great ways to do that. And it is a massive motivator for, um, for all of our students. 
All right, so now let's talk about some best practices that we can have for increasing that motivation in our students. Um, good news, if you're following Brenda's model, you're already doing a lot of these things. So I'm just gonna kind of highlight some things that you can do or to continue to do or that you might wanna tweak a little bit in your micro schools to help build that motivation in your students. <clears throat> so the first one that has to happen before anything else is building trust. You've got to start with heart. You've got to have that relationship with your students. And one of the best ways to me to do that is to let your students know who you are as a person. So, you know, if you're really into running marathons, let your students know you like that. You know, if you're really into um, I don't, playing video games, like I, share yourself with your students. Say you love cats. OK, so talk to your students about that. They'll come to you and share those. And that builds those really great relationships. Um, you also want to allow time for those relationships to build within your micro school with your students, with each other. So allow time for social skills and for team building activities. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is some students, especially a lot of our students with identified disabilities, um, you have to teach them how to learn and you need to build lessons in that show how to do that like, and be very, very explicit in your instructions. Like, what does that mean? So what is your body doing? What are your feet doing while you're sitting at your computer? What is your brain doing? What is your mind doing? What is your mouth doing? What are your hands doing? You can create all kinds of visuals. You can go Google some. There's a lot of different ways to teach this whole body listening um, and it's really important not to just assume that students know these things just because, you know, say they're a seventh grader. That doesn't mean that they know what they're supposed to be doing. It's really good to always give those clear expectations up front. Another good way to build motivation in your students is to make their learning meaningful. So this can happen with real life application. Um, build in discussions about why we're learning what we're learning and make sure that the activities reflect that. I can give one really quick example that I used with my son recently and he helped me figure out um, what my monthly payments needed to be to pay off a credit card in a certain amount of time and that we use lots of different math skills to figure that out and that was really meaningful to him. To, okay, now I know why I'm learning, you know, division and multiplication and all of this stuff because it was useful. Um, Again, I'm going to throw this one out there because it's so important. Learning based on student interest. Uh, they're so much more likely to work on a project if they're interested in it. So if you're doing a writing assignment or something like that, build in some kind of interest for them. Let them pick a topic or, you know, let them share. This is especially um, this is really important during those uh, create times where they can follow their passions. All right, so here we go, allow for collaboration. That's gonna be when students can work together to build on each other's strengths. So if something is really difficult for one child, they might can assist another student and that's gonna help build up confidence in both of them and also to help bridge those gaps where they might have deficits in their learning. Um, student created goals. Here again, this is something that we do at Prenda. Like this is part of our model that we do every single day with students. But when students create their own goals, then they have some ownership of it and they're much more likely to give it their all. If you come in and you're just told a list of things to do as an adult, you're much less likely to do that list of things than if you come up with them on your own. These are the things that you want to do. So that's where student choice is going to really come in and creating those goals that they want to follow. One thing, too, that is important to remember is it needs to be a choice and not a requirement. That ownership of learning is what's really most important in giving students a chance to choose correctly. They might not choose correctly every day, but that's OK because they're still learning how to make those choices. We'll go back in a minute and we'll talk about what do you do if that happens. Um, and also, one thing that's really important, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Now, yes, what you say is important, but more how you present yourself, how you present your uh, your guidance to students. That's what's most important is how you present yourself. You've already built the relationship with the student. So you need to bring your calm to a situation and don't get in a power struggle with I. You said you were going to do two Lexia lessons today. You must do two Lexia lessons. Like if, if there's going to be a power struggle there, you need to let it go as the adult move away and then come back and address it later. 
Sorry. Right, so building self-esteem with positive talk is also something that's really, really important. So we talked about that, like a lot of motivation or a lack of motivation in students comes from that, that thought that maybe they can't do something. So it could be something that they've heard, they've been told before. It could be something that they've just experienced with schoolwork before or that they believe about themselves. So the best way to teach that positive self-talk is to use an I do, we do, you do model. So this, I is used a lot in, in education to like teach something. So like, I'm going to model for you what positive self-talk is. You know, I know I'll be able to run in the 5k because I've been practicing and I'm so proud of myself for the hard work that I've put in. So say that to your students, say that in front of them so that they can hear you doing that positive self-talk. Then we do. You can model this in a group activity. You know, we all use that affirming language with each other. Right? Everybody say it with me. We can do this. You know, we can make this cake. We can do whatever. Um, have everybody say it. And that's going to be something that they hear in themselves. And then encourage that with that you do model. Encourage students to use this language when they're working independently. You know, if you sit down with a student that's struggling with the lesson, then just remind them, you know, you can do it. You know, come on, you can say that. Say you can do it and have them um, practice that skill. And then you really want to make everybody feel capable. Um, growth is the point, not how fast we get there. So if it takes a student a really long time to meet their goals, that's OK, as long as they're putting forth their best effort. And also, you really want to working on that praise. You want to praise effort and diligence. That's that targeted feedback that students are going to get. Um, you don't say, <laughs> Good job. You got all the answers right, because the goal is to build that self-esteem so that students know that they're capable of doing hard work. So you want to praise their hard work. I love how you are working hard. I love how you persevered through that really difficult challenge. And or, you know, I love how you brought a lot of ideas to the table so you could figure something out. All right. Now let's talk some more about feedback. You really have to be accurate in your feedback. Again, you've got to have a trusting relationship with your students where they trust you. They know that you have their best their best life in mind. You want them to learn. You want them to grow. So as long as they know that about you as the guide, you can be honest with them about their performance. Um, you know, so you didn't meet your goal today. OK, why do you think that is? What should we look? What should tomorrow look like? What steps can we take to meet your goal in the future? What do you think that we need to change? Um, and is there something about how we're working that might need to be changed? And remember, you're going to guide by asking, not telling. You're not going to come in and say, hey, you didn't meet your goal. This is what you need to do tomorrow so that you're sure that you meet your goal. We want to build the students internal motivation. So we want them to be thinking those things. They know they didn't reach their goal. So we want them to think about why that might be. And we're there to guide them and help them plan for the future. And you can do this by modeling your own failures. So talk to a process of when you fail or talk to students about things that you've done that did not go as planned. You know, wow, I was going to do this really complicated recipe and I followed the recipe. At least I thought I did. And it came out and, you know, it burnt and I set the fire alarm off in my house because there was smoke everywhere. It was really terrible. Um, but that's OK. We ordered pizza and I'll try that recipe again a different time. Um, that's doing that modeling of how to deal with your own failures to give students an example of what to do. All right, so here are some tips for what what you can do if you're stuck somewhere or to increase motivation. So you guys are the ones that are out there as the guides. You're out there every day. You have fabulous, amazing ideas that I've learned from so much from talking to people. So um, I got some great ideas on some different specific areas of what guides are doing in their classrooms right now or in their micro schools right now. So um, if you're stuck, think outside of the box and change something up. So Claire Olson said when kids are, have been working on something and suddenly stop seeing they're bored and they don't want to do it anymore, it means they need a break. A quick few laps around the yard, a stretch or a change in activity can help them come back to the task ready to tackle it again. Um, so that's a great idea of how to change up the environment so that students can remain engaged. Make sure students know that you believe in them. Laura Player says that each of the, the kids are very different in her class, but I know the overarching thing that has helped their motivation is that I believed in them. 
all of the kids came to my class with the mindset that they couldn't do something because they'd been previously told they couldn't. Once they genuinely felt that I believed in them, they believed in themselves and the progression came naturally. So that is going to build like once once you've got that trusting relationship, progress is going to happen. Building some fun. Um, Jeremy Nelson said, in my classroom, we play spelling and math games. I've found it to be very successful to build confidence for my students who typically detest the subjects. It allows for uh, for repetition and a fun challenge. So find a way to make something that is typically not fun, fun, like spelling. Typically, you don't think of spelling as being something that's really engaging, but there are ways around that. And this is a really great one to make it fun. All right, allowing for collaboration and involvement. So Claire Olson also shared that when one of my students complains that they don't want to participate in something that we're doing in class, I ask them to help me with it. Even if they just get to pass out papers or hold up an example, it usually sparks their interest in what we're doing and they end up joining us. Sometimes pairing them up to work on a project helps to motivate the reluctant ones. So that's that idea that, you know, you don't want to get in that power struggle. If the student says they don't want to do something, OK, fine, you don't want to do that here. Look, can you give these papers to everybody else? That's going to pull that student in a lot of times. Building intentional time for relationship building among students and with you as the guide. Uh, Virginia Coco said, ask the parents what the students like to do in their free time. What is the student's favorite movie or comic book character or TV show? Then tailor your lessons to incorporate those things that interest the student. And then Melissa Richardson also shared one Monday or on Mondays for circle time, we celebrate successes from the previous week. On Wednesdays for circle time, we do famous failures. The kids take turns researching and presenting someone today or in a history that's failed a lot but became successful in the end. And then each Friday for circle time, we watch a motivational speech. And that builds those examples of what how to deal with failures. All right, and then another one is visuals. So a lot of our students with disabilities, and this is one of those things that can help all students, but a lot of students always also do this, or it's also helpful for them. So um, Hava Hoffman shared one huge thing that I did was create a visual schedule for one of my students since he had sped classes, OT and speech through the entire week. I used a Velcro on the schedule and that way each day I only put up what he was doing that day so that it didn't overwhelm him for the whole week's schedule. I used images I thought he'd like, Mario Brothers, etc., and also printed off a fun Lego one for when he had completed his online classes. He also loves to draw and it's a really great um, at He's really great at it, so I printed off special pages and a comic book template for him to create his own comics. He loves doing it and loves that he's using, I love that he's using his writing skills. So that's building in that interest. So I've also put up some examples of some things that you can start with. These are definitely not the goal. This is how to start your students on building that internal motivation. You can have some little tasks, um, like task visuals. So the first image on there is just like, we're going to practice reading, so we've got that reward at the end that we're going to dance, but I've put dinosaurs on there because this kid was really interested in dinosaurs. And then the other one is a token board. So this is, you know, I'll say in my seat, I will work hard. These are my goals. I'm going to, when I'm done, I get a reward. So for every, you know, two or three minutes, you put a sticker up, something like that, and then you get your reward. Again, this is a step on the way to building internal motivation. This is not the goal and this is not something that I would use for the end all be all. This is something to get students started and then you can kind of fade this type of thing out. All right, so those are a lot of ideas for things that you can take and do. So now going forward, what can you do to help build your toolbox of knowledge for how to help students build their own motivation? One thing is to develop a social emotional learning plan. Um, there's a lot of talk about this right now. There's a lot of research coming out about how having social emotional learning with students is so important. Um, so we're going to highlight a couple of different places you can go to look for that. One of them is the Zones of Regulation. The website is right here. Um, they have a book that you can read that kind of explains the whole process of what the zones of regulation are. Um, there's also a lot of free webinars and resources for social emotional learning. This can be used from students anywhere from preschool all the way up through adults. They have resources for all of those. And it's basically like different zones that you can feel. And green is where we want to be when we're ready to learn. I am calm. I am happy. My body feels good then the blue zone has its own emotions tied to it and then the yellow zone and the red zone so you can find solutions to move from that zone back to green to help you be ready to learn
Great, thank you. Um, one other recommended resource we wanted to give you guys that is just like, I'm gonna give you two seconds of it and you really just need to go spend some time there because it's enormous. I have two pictures to show you, but like you could spend days just looking at the resources here. Um, and that is Stanford Harmony. So Stanford Harmony um, is affiliated with a larger network of teacher support, but Stanford Harmony in particular um, is built all around social emotional learning. Um, so two resources I wanted you guys to know about is there is actually different topics and modules for us as facilitators, educators, guides to learn more. So that this screenshot here is an example of some of the modules that um, present research. They're very engaging. They usually have a, like a make it and take it now type option within them too. And you can choose different topics. Um, just a little heads up, there's things outside of just social emotional learning here too that are on the website. So you can go and look around for other topics if you're interested too. Um, but social emotional learning is a huge one. Um, so teachers of age of change, um, helping students want to achieve. This is a set of modules specifically around motivation. So it's continued learning for us as adults as we engage with our students. The other thing I wanted to show you, and again, these are two things on this like massive resource, so I suggest you guys check it out, um, is interactive lesson plans and activities for students around these areas. So um, again, go check it out, same website, but you can see these different units, diversity and inclusion, empathy, communication, problem solving, and peer relationships. And within each of these, they're, they're like units with tons of information, resources, tips, et cetera, um, on how to build this in um, with an individual student, with a classroom, um, um, and with different age groups too. So definitely check it out. And you can see here, I highlighted grades one and two, but you can move the drop down for different grade levels and for different topics. So definitely recommend checking out those two resources as you further your knowledge on this topic um, and work with the individual students in your micro school. Well, we wanted to say thank you so much for giving your time today and joining us for this conversation about motivating all of our learners. Um, we wanted to close with sharing uh, how to get a hold of us and continue the conversation further. So for general questions for our team or general conversations, they don't have to be questions, you can reach out to our team inbox and that's sped at prendo.co, it's at the top of your screen right now. And I wanted to share quickly about just our team um, who you can reach out to directly at any time too. So our coordinator team, um, there are four total coordinator, or serving on the coordinator team right now, Tracy, Amruta, Miranda, and Sydney. So you might hear from them at different times. You can always reach out to them too. They're gonna work with individual students um, who receive ex exceptional student services of some kind. Um, we also have Dave, who's here today, as student study team. So student study team is for students who are at risk for different reasons, and we're working to build interventions um, and uh, supports at a more individual level. Um, you can also reach out to me anytime as well. I serve as the student services manager for our team. So again, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here with all of you today and have an amazing rest of your day at your other sessions. Thank you guys.